Uh, I will just give you a very brief uh, introduction to this day, and then I think the best thing to do is to introduce ourselves. We are recording this. Number one, Mervyn promised us he will do his best to make it live for the two ministers who are arriving now, sometime now, so they will see it even before Wednesday. So we will do our best. Whatever has been here, it will be available for them to watch it in their hotel, either tonight, possibly tomorrow. And we are hoping to meet them on Wednesday. This is the first thing. Now, I'm sure I have communicated this with all of you, but the, the initial uh, idea was to meet them today, and they were very happy to meet you, both of them, the Minister of Education and Higher Education. But at the last moment yesterday, the day before, their visa did not arrive. So there is no way to come here. So the only way to, to wait for the visa to arrive, which arrived yesterday, and they left this morning, and I mean, until night, they said to me, yes, everything is fine. So they're supposed to almost landing now. So uh, the ambassador said he will do his best to bring them here immediately from the airport before they go to their hotel. Inshallah, this might happen. But the, when I was in Sudan, just to give you the background, I met both of them. And I met the Minister, the minister of Education actually two times, very lengthy meeting than the higher education. And Professor Mohammed Tom, you know him, he's a statistician, he was the dean of the School of Math. He's a well-respected academic, I'm sure you can read about him. I asked him, the situation of education is very, 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 I don't know what to call it, it's, it's a real, real challenge. He's overwhelmed what to do. Because I think the big problem for him, if you look to the education strategy of the United Kingdom, the first block is about the teacher. The teacher is critical in making the whole process work. But in Sudan, the teacher, unfortunately, no one even talk about him now because you're talking about a school without classrooms. You're talking about schools without toilets. So you can't talk about the teacher without even the students they don't have room to sit in. And he said, you may have seen him in the video, he need to build, I think, 64,000 or 74,000, I'm not sure, classrooms. This is what he is aware of. He needs to build them physically so the students can go to primary school. I have seen by myself, we have been f f uh, yani volunteering in school in our place in, in Medani. There's no toilets. I know when I say this, maybe they didn't really get that point. There's no toilets in schools. And the school I'm referring to, it used to be the top, the top school in Medani. Medani is the second city in Sudan. It's like, I don't know, like Birmingham. And many graduate from that school. There is no toilet. Wallahi al I have seen it by myself. And I said to them, what do you mean? To the head teachers, to me, come, I'll tell you what I mean. So we went, the, all three uh, toilets, they were blocked with, with stones and so on. And then the question many people will say to you, don't ask where the kids do the toilet or when they want to do toilet. Because they do it anywhere outside the school. Or the, so this is a real situation. So this is what he's facing. And then the third thing, the second thing, uh, many of the classroom, they are not like this comfortably sealed. Water can actually easily, in the rainy season, they can't stay. Most of them, this is, we're talking about cities, not camps or outside Khartoum or Madani. So the second, what we're thinking is to help him financially, this is another thing we want to launch when he comes here, with money to help him, number one, fix the toilets, make sure all classroom before the rainy season, they are actually... Uh, closed or sealed enough so there is no leakage of water. And number three, which is very important, you may have seen it, when kids arrive to many schools in Sudan, they can't get into the school because of flooding. You know, they can't reach the classroom. So that's only need to be, I mean, I, mean, I know the engineers, they, they can easily, they said this can easily be done by just bringing lots of, uh, it's just really need to build this, uh, not really to build them with, or by cement, but more of just to bring, I don't know what you call it, to wrap, to be, terduma, what do you, what does that mean in, in engineering mean? <laughs> just bringing... Uh, 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 yes, too, yeah, that's all what, we, what we, we're hoping to. So we agreed with him, and we discussed with him, is that we you are the first people to know this, we haven't done it yet, is to launch an international appeal for education in Sudan. And that international appeal is simply to collect money by the end of February, this February, as soon as possible from all the Sudanese outside, straight to the government uh, account under the full supervision and the disposal of the Minister of Education. So if you want to donate, we already talked to the embassy and they said that's easy. 
We want to talk to the all embassies. They will collect this money officially through the government account, not through anything, not through the knowledge or any charity. If you want to donate, donate straight to the government account. And that money will then be consolidated by the end of February, and it will be for the disposable of the Minister of, of Education, whom you will see on Wednesday. And the priority, which one to go first, what to do, is up to them. We will not engage in that one. So that's what he likes, and he was very keen for Hamdouk, the Prime Minister, to also record a short supporting message. Aisha, you know, uh, Her Excellency in the, uh, the premium uh, Council, she was very supportive. So the three of them, they wanted, but we couldn't meet all of them because of, the, you know, the whole, what was happening at that time. They went to the Guinea and so on. So the idea is to help them financially before the end of February, as much as possible, across the world. So what you can do in your social media, Facebook, whatever, just tell your friends, once we launch this, to donate. If you are in Saudi Arabia, a consultant or an engineer, just donate to the official government account. No Sudan knowledge or no any charity or anything. Let's just go all go to the, uh, the government. And then the government will take it themselves and they challenge it themselves. So that's under discussion now. But this is what we think physical, what we can do to help him with the physical infrastructure. Regarding the other issue, what he specifically said he won't help with them, Number one, he said he, ne he need people to give him ideas about how to improve the situation for students, for education in Sudan, ideas. And secondly, he said he need people who are expert on curriculum development. And that's very specific word because, for, don't forget, he's an academic, he knows what he means by that word. So, for example, that word doesn't apply to me. I'm not an expert or I don't have any knowledge about curriculum development for undergraduate. But for me, if it's a, a university, I am. Because that part of my training is how to develop a curriculum for a postgraduate. So he needs really people who will help him in curriculum development. One challenge his undersecretaries told us, they don't know whether the curriculum currently in Sudan about, you know about this issue about how it fits and so on, this is one issue. But whether this is a, the right curriculum to transfer students from your school to university. They don't know, and they ask for help. They don't know whether this curriculum is the right curriculum to take students to become doctors or engineers and so on. And I have met one of our volunteers. He said to me, Alam, I said to him, congratulations. He just graduated from an IT school. He said to me, Alam, shall I tell you the truth? I said, yes. He said to me, I can't see a single thing, a single thing. I learned from the university, help me or will help me in what I'm doing. He's a YouTube blogger and he earned money from that. He has no idea what he learned from the university, he said, in terms of helping him to get a job done. So if, if I take this back many years ago, when I went to the Faculty of Agriculture, I remember my cousin said to me, this is in Sudan, you remember? It used to be called the Faculty of Faculties. Because in the Faculty of Agriculture, they teach you 45 subjects, including economics, statistics, vitamins, chemistry, everything. And I went to that school and I graduated. She was right. When I, I went, I changed my career to MBA, I got, I think, B plus in my economics because I studied economics, the same like a school of economics. Saad al Madani taught me economics, one of the best economists, I think, in the in, in, worldwide. I studied uh, statistics, I studied finance, and so on. So I was able to progress, I, I was able to change my career completely. The only subject I struggled with was finance. I studied it, but not as strong as people in a finance school and so on. Now, imagine you have a student, he said to you, I have no idea what I learned. I know vitamins, I have, taught, uh, have been taught in the school vitamins and so on, genetics, all these things. But let's move from this subject. So that's what he want help with. The third help he said he wanted, specifically, he said he want as much as possible to see, to, to explore quickly, the kind, any, any volunteering to help schools. So either yourself or kids, your son, your daughter, or anyone want to go and spend some time in Sudan teaching in schools, math, English, physics, whatever it is. This one, we can help him in the structure. So if we, if we will agree, I'm not an expert on how to select these volunteers. Uh, Bedri is already doing that, so we want to work with him and others. But maybe we can help them in setting this online submission form uh, and then submission is easy. We have people can help with them, electronic submission, all that technical part. 
But what's important, how actually you process these submissions? How do you filter them? And I'm sure people with education, they know much better. You need to filter them, whether you'll get them to school, how do you qualify them? We, just don't, we don't want just to send people, we don't know. We need to listen to people who they know this. Are these people really, imagine you got uh, one of our, our kids here, she finished, say, physics in Queen Mary. Is she the right person to go and volunteer? If yes, how she will volunteer? Uh, what do we need to check? It has to be a system. And my suggestion, that system should be really closely supervised between expert from outside and the minister is there. So it's not just, well, and I think it will be good. I said to Ahmed Badri, if we support his initiative, rather than we start a new one, but the idea is if we can get all the volunteering for schools through that system. So if you got your cousin in Saudi Arabia or in America said, I would like to go and volunteer, you say to him, go to this system because it's, so we will support it and let it work. So this is the three point. He need four ideas, uh, people expert to help him how to investigate and evaluate the current curriculum. And number three, any ideas on volunteering. So any one of you see, take this into account when you have your five minutes here. Regarding the Ministry of Higher Education, I can tell you what I have seen before I tell you what I listened to her. The status of the universities is very poor. I know if you say this in publicly, people will say, Alam no, Hakuma, you don't break down the, what is it? Uh, it's nothing to do with the politics. This is a fact. Let's forget, let's put the politics aside. Our universities are in a very poor status. There is no question. Wallahi al-Azim, if I show you senior associate professors submission to the conference which we held, you can't even explain to an associate professor a difference between a biographical note of 100 words and a CV. Wallahi, we have this problem. Wallahi, you cannot appreciate. We ask them for a high-definition picture so it will be, we tell them why we need the pictures. It's good because this is how we communicate, seeing people know you and so on. Wallah, you can't believe someone will take the picture, put it in, a, I don't know, his dining, a, a, a lunch or breakfast, and then he take a picture by his mobile. You can see the remaining of the dish, dish his picture. This is the level of professionalism we have seen. I'm not against them. We are helping. This is where we can really help. Also, most of you, I think all of you, I know we, higher education is much easier because this was our field, but the situation is very, very, very tough. And Ahmed and why they were teaching that last two weeks in the medical school, which is the best, not only in Sudan, one of the best in Africa, they can tell you when they talk because they were there with Cambridge's team. They can tell you more about it. It's really difficult. Uh, when I met the minister, she said, yes, global ranking, the, now University of Khartoum is doing it and so on and so on. Communication is very poor. Uh, you send message. Oh, why you didn't tell us about this workshop, Alam? Uh, but we advertised it, but we didn't know. And then you ask, uh, I mean, I don't want to try to mention names, so it will be. The, uh, one say, I will circulate it to all the University of Khartoum, and then we end up, it has been circulated, but many people didn't listen to it, didn't see it. And I said, but where did you circulate it? They said, WhatsApp. Forget about email. There's no email working there. Wallahi, I'm telling you. Anything on email, that means the same like the example, you remember in Saudi Arabia, they said if someone described, he's trying to explain to you where is his house, he said to you near that mosque on the right, that means he doesn't want you to come. Because there's many mosques on the same street. So email in Sudan, it doesn't work. And it's, in the same times, I went to Univer University of Sudan, University of uh, Science and Technology. Jamaat Sudan al Ulum and Technology. Right? Sudan University of Science and Technology. Wallahi, I was very impressed. They have 11 or 12 scientific publications. They know what is citation. They know what is ref. Wallahi, Lazim. Amal, what's his name? Bakhit. Professor is the professor Amal Amal Bakhit. She is the head of scientific, uh, graduate scientific division of <coughs> she, They know what scientific publication, and they already subscribe to the Nigerian-based uh, uh, database. They know how much it costs. They know they're reviewing. They're very, very much advanced. So you can see that. What I found it overwhelmingly strange, they, they, you, you will come to a nice room like this. This is going on in Sudan for many years, by the way. Although you tell them the most important part for me 
in this room is the projector and the screen. They are the most important. These are the least important in Sudan. So you go, nice room, like a Turabi. They said the best lecture theater in Khartoum University is a Turabi, uh, what's his name? The Fa'alla Turabi lecture theater in the engineering. Okay, this is the best lecture theater. Very nice, far better chairs. It got its base, you can have catering. Very nice, no question. But you remember, my, I'm talking, oh, my Mervyn, yeah, I'm talking English, so you remember it. Then you pick up four microphones, none of them is working. Battery is not working. So it's, you're not going to enjoy that lecture, which takes 250 people. Uh, the projector, you struggle with it. The projector is broadcasting or in, on, on, on a wall. Not, so the basic stuff, which we consider here basic for the success of this talk now, is this one. They don't understand. This is the most important part. So what they actually lack in is very basic. And I am going to launch an appeal. Anyone, academic, who's traveling to Sudan, we can coordinate this with al uh, I know they should help. He should just, for, uh, if you want to donate something, buy them a very good projector for 150 or 50 pound, and then give it to any university. So we can maybe organize this with uh, tax people if you go through this system. It will be a tremendous help if you donate to a university, not this big one, the small one, you know? Extremely good. So that's a big problem. All of them, they don't really have that, they don't uh, uh, realize the importance of this. And lastly, when we met her, I think she is overwhelmed. I think the, the, the challenge is quite a lot. And there's many issues, private, public, uh, accreditation, auditing of universities, you don't know really. And you can see now that the degree to go through universities, many people have been promoted uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, and we all know this. Many professors, they, they can't even write a paper in English. I think it's quite difficult to, I, I know, I have met professors from Spain, they came to <coughs> big universities, they talk in non-English, but at least you expect them reasonably. A professor have not a, a single art publications outside Sudan. All his publications, I have seen one of these. Nothing wrong with the language, but it doesn't, it's not something usual we see. We travel all over the world. Even China, Latin America, India, Sal not necessarily you go to a country, go look to the Arab countries, they publish in English. Eh? But I have seen a professor from one university, he got the PhD, but all the publications are in Arabic and all produced by in Sudan. So this is another challenge. So you have to appreciate, we don't want to criticize anyone, no, but we really need to help them. The scale is very, very serious. The good thing is, you will see her, she is very determined to help. But the, the scale is overwhelming. And the things I can tell you now, and this is recorded, by the way, I don't hide anything. The tension between us here outside and the people inside is very high. You, you will be shy to say anything like this because they will immediately, oh, you live in London, you, this is Sussex, this is not Sussex, and lots of stuff, which I don't see it when I go everywhere. I have been to Indonesia, Malaysia, Latin America. I have been everywhere. Very poor country, they've been to Tunisia. Tunisia, they don't speak in English, they speak in French. But they accept you when you talk to them. They know you know better than them in terms of <coughs> research, vision, strategy, and so on. But in Sudan, the tension is very, very high. And they always have that in mind. You might come here to criticize them. You think they don't know good. And they can tell you that straight. Or you come here, you spend your holiday. Uh, well, like this is a real problem. Some of them, they are graduate from British American universities. They shouldn't. They know that they are the same like us, we are not better than them, but they really the tension is very high. Nothing to do with any politics. If you start talking about, and Ahmed can tell you, we had a workshop like this in the University of Khartoum about uh, in, uh, strategic uh, planning and performance improvement in higher education. They actually appreciated, and the, the things we, we were di discuss, discussing, they were very basic, but I can see from many of the professors, this is quite a lot for them to see it, how important is it, like feedback. Ahmed was talking to them about how do we learn. He was talking to them about feedback from his students. The students, they will tell you very strange stories. So this is where I think you need to think about the higher education. I wouldn't take it long. The conference we had, it was very successful. The good thing is we managed to create a platform from all places, uh, business people. We had partner from the business uh, people. They came, most of the businesses, they came engineers, government. We didn't expect even to succeed. It was oversubscribed. And I remember uh, in two days, or, or even the people who paid money for their food from outside, we couldn't get food 
because there is lots of number of people in the, in the room. So it was very successful in terms of attracting people. So I think we can build on this for next year. Uh, we had people from different uh, institutions, from private sector, and I can tell you the most uh, calls I received to see and meet officials, you can't believe it, is from the Ministry of Interior. I was being called three times, and I met the minister, but I didn't put his pictures on my Facebook because I remember he, there was a big row on the media about. The, the Ministry of Interior, they have three, four people I met with BHDs. There's so much talk about training, capacity building, more than any other ministry I met. I'm just giving you observation. I'm not saying this is the best people, but interestingly, the, the, the interior ministry have, has, has been transformed. All of them, they got master degree, the same like UAE, I remember when we met them. Two people I met, they introduced themselves, high rank, Dr. X, Y, that, and he's PhD in strategic management. And they are talking all about training, capacity building, and they told me they came here to London three months, blah, blah. So you can still see there are some ministries high advanced in thinking about future training and so on. So I will stop here. And I think it's better, uh, and if you need to follow this one, the videos, we expect them anytime. All the videos have been recorded. There was, there was a, I'm not saying dominant, but there are lots of medical uh, and health uh, sector papers on the conference. And Bani, I think he will arrive, he will stop over, Professor Bani, he's stopping over, he will join us at some point today. There was lots of articles on health, public health, and there were lots of people coming from Turkey, from UK, like Wail, people from Saudi, from America, from whatever it is. So, although, despite that, I'm very pleased we had lots of good papers this year on two topics we have never touched before, like mining. There was a big session, I think two sessions on mining. Very, very good stuff on mining, mercury, uh, all this stuff. There was a very good workshop there. And also, I'm very pleased there was a very good workshop on planning and infrastructure and city planning. It is led by our colleague from Scotland, Cole Khalid. was highly, fully attended by engineers, by officials, government, really well attended. And also, we had a workshop the first day on uh, health and safety, was well attended. And we heard many stories there about lots of stuff. That's another area. So I will stop here. And I think the best way, if, we, if I can pass the mic on each one of you to introduce himself for us and also for the recording. This recording, we will make sure it will really spread. And also, if you, in your introduction, tell who you are. And I think if you can narrow down at least key one key or two, three words about your expertise, and I can assure you, we will give this to everyone. Minister of Interior, Agriculture, everywhere. At least what are the key words about yourself? If I, I will start by myself, my key words are strategic planning, leadership, knowledge management, technology transfer, and performance improvement. These are my key words. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Abdul Karim Ibrahim. And I am a senior consultant for Westminster City Council in London for community engagement and community development. Uh, I'm also a qualified primary school teacher. I don't have the presentation uh, per se today, but um, I was interested in listening to what, what you said during your introduction about one of the schools in Sudan uh, in terms of the facilities. Uh, so my question to you, and I found it quite shocking what you said actually is, is there not a list of standard regulations that has to be met before an institution of education is, is open. Uh, for example, here in this country, you have to have those facilities that you mentioned, such as toilets, such as places where to eat, and even play facilities. Is there not, does that not exist in Sudan? And if so, why have they not been met? Well, I think this is a good question, and I think maybe the best thing to do, uh, because we will see the minister himself, and if not, to, definitely on Wednesday, that would be the first question I think he will have to address it. I think very good to give it to him yeah. so he can actually get exactly. Yeah. There are, but they are not being followed at all. Right. Not only in education, in many things. <laughs> My name is Al-Jizul Isaddiq Mukhtar. I work uh, with London Underground. I have an uh, IT master degree from East London University. I specialize in management, um, I IT. And I have a teaching practice certificate. I teach in uh, Westminster Adult Education for three years. 
and I'm working with the community for more than 20 years. In, uh, my name is uh, Muna Rashid Diab. Uh, I've been here for 29 years, almost. My background is um, graduate uh, from economics and statistics. I have been work like six years at Ministries of Planning at Sudan, working in a big range of uh, uh, lo department of loans and grant, working with the work uh, where lead band uh, in the bilingual uh, the development. And um, here in the UK, I'm working in, uh, I changed my career to education. So I have um, a degree of in education, a bilingual assistant TA, and uh, facilitated from and training for trainee. Uh, my key work is uh, community, families, and children education and learning skills, and training for trainee. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Mohammed Shumu. But professional and um, mechanical engineer, uh, graduate, uh, specialized in manufacturing and industrial engineering. Uh, I work for uh, most of my career in the car industry. Uh, recently changed to oil and gas. Uh, my field of specialty is, is manufacturing, quality engineering. Uh, I deal with performance management, strategic planning, uh, quality control, quality assurance. Uh, I do part-time uh, lecturing at University of East London. And uh, I'm here to try to help uh, uh, in the New Sudan. Uh, my name is Abu Bakr Shaddad. I am a doctor, I'm a consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist. I uh, can also claim that I have some experience in the academia as I worked for four years as a lecturer in medicine at the National University of Ireland um, in Galway. Um, I'm also affiliated with a number of uh, charity organizations both in the UK and the Sudan and we have some ongoing projects um, which uh, with the aim to support um, education and training in Sudan. Um, uh, we all wanted to work together and kind of um, join hands to, to do um, projects, especially with the favorite, um, um, favorable um, change happening in, my, in our country in terms of um, political interface which sh should bring more hope to develop and um, improve the lifestyle and education and training in every aspect of life in our country. Marshal Hajj Siddiq, PhD researcher, Queen Mary University uh, in uh, breast cancer clinical trial. The uh, key words are honey and uh, cancer research. Uh, my name is uh, Farida Fulchin. I'm a, a professor at the Mary. My background training is in medicine and in dentistry. Uh, I'm a clinical academic. My expertise internationally is implementation of education and health projects and quality assuring uh, them. I work in several countries in Africa and uh, this is really uh, to implement both education and health and to find local solutions and African solutions to how to manage a good quality education and health and increase literacy rates. Good afternoon. Um, <coughs> my name is Wal Bashari. I'm an endocrinologist. Um, I work in Cambridge University Hospital. And I also, um, in addition to my clinical work there, I do um, have some hats in uh, medical education and, and research. So currently I do uh, research work in molecular endocrinology. 
and I also participate in, in some teaching for undergraduate medical students. I, together with my colleague Ahmed, who will introduce himself next, uh, worked to um, to introduce an international collaboration between the University of Khartoum and the University of Cambridge, particularly um, capitalizing on work on education and, and healthcare. And hopefully we'll show you some of what we've done um, uh, in due course. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmed Al Usman. Uh, I am a doctorate as well. Uh, training in Cambridge University Hospital and uh, now I'm doing my regular training in Leeds uh, and I've done a one year postgraduate degree as well in medical education so I have a sort of relation with undergraduate and medical education both um, here in the UK and in Sudan as well. Thanks. I'm Maimon Idris. I've just completed my research degree at um, UCL in Urban Sustainability and Resilience um, my key interests are to do mostly with environmental research, but I have worked in academia for the last three years. I work at Imperial College um, and I've worked um, coordinating uh, masters and GP training. Um, so I, I, have, I have some experience in education. Um, and my key words are really um, about community development, uh, frugal innovation, um, knowledge transfer um, and sustainable development. Uh, my name is Saif Bashir, a graduate of uh, University of Khartoum, Political Science, and um, LSE, a postgraduate. I, am, I would label myself as an expert in higher education, uh, currently director of uh, Smart Education, uh, logistics and training services. Um, keywords, higher education, um, accreditation, ranking, universities ranking, um, KPIs in education generally. Actually, uh, the ideas to improve education at Sudan, uh, we have to prepare our vision, how we want to improve the education system at Sudan by using changing in a curriculum and teachers and uh, children because they are the three cycle we have to talk to think about that so our vision it will be to improve the curriculum according to the vision of Sudan what we need for the high education what we need for the employee what we need to develop Sudan as well uh, to um, explore the volunteers to help in Sudan. We have uh, now a big generation, they graduate from England uh, Uni and they need to go back to Sudan. And uh, one of these things I have experienced for my daughter, she wanna go back to Sudan to help to work over there. So we have to plan system, how we help them to integrate in a system, in education system in Sudan by preparing curriculum. Most of them they have to teach in English language because they can't help in Arabic language uh, or the other subjects. So to provide them by um, uh, strategy and uh, place environment to work. The other thing, uh, teachers, we have to think about how to train teachers to be effective, effective teachers at Sudan. Thank you. Okay. More than five minutes or less? Let me <laughs> you said about this volunteer, the minister was yeah. very keen. And our kids here, they don't speak Arabic, most of them. Yes, so this is why they... How can they help them? Uh, if they are not teaching English, if they were physics, chemistry, so how can they teach them? Uh, or how can we help them? Uh, we can help them by by to let them to to work in for the English particular, but the other subjects they can't find themselves. And what is your suggestion? Shall we seek maybe other uh, people who can speak Arabic? Yes, and I'm, I'm trying to prepare to say something because uh, Ahmed Bedri yes. he has a very good uh, and experience and view in that thing. We can try to find um, a channel a channel a formal channel to help them with the ministries of education there and higher education. 
and try to have a training for them. Because when they left for the first time, we have to try to, uh, the, like they have the um, cultural, barrier cultural. My daughter, she facing that one challenging for her when she left to Sudan. She didn't find her, even she worked with the um, uh, Care International. So very good in, uh, organization, but she still she faced with the cultural thing, the environment. Like you said, that projectors, beans, uh, um, uh, whiteboard, they can't work in, in that environment until they have a money, resource to help them to work in that thing. Maybe I'm gonna, from your experience, and if you have been in, in teaching or in school very long time, do you think priority now to fix these rooms first, uh, board, bands, as you suggested, and then we try to go through curriculum, or you think they can go alongside? Because that's something we discussed. Yeah, the, the, we have to go through uh, all all the stuffs together. Okay. The curriculum, Paris, and build build schools like you said that without place we can't work. Okay. So place and curriculum, and after that they can start uh, to find themselves and they find outside. Maybe I'm best with someone. I don't want to ask it, but like in the Kitiani, one of the actors in the experiment. In Sudan, I think the Gulen Wazir, he likes what you said, or Ahmed Badri, all of them. In Sudan, they will, like, they might claim they will say these people they are teaching in British schools, which is one of the leading country worldwide in education. Blah blah blah. It's not relevant to us. How can you answer them now? You are relevant to Sudan. Do you think yourself you are relevant? to school, teaching, curriculum, do you think all your other, like you, sir, sir, all of those people, how relevant do you think you are to the school? I can, I can be relevant. Yes, how, yes. Uh, I can go back and even when I'm left every time for a holiday, I've been with the school and my community and helped them. And every time I took uh, uh, curriculum from here, particularly I'm working now with the special education needs at nursery and I, I have a channel like that to work with them. But my question, I can work like five years. My question, the our generation now, how we help them to integrate in a Sudan okay. back? So if my daughter, she can go back, she can't work like me because I'm growing in that situation. Okay. If I didn't find toilet or good schools because I'm being in a mainstream school in Sudan, yes. not like the other, my other sisters, they've been in the private. So my, concern now to help the generation. This is the graduate people to go back to Sudan to work. They have, they can accept for a situation, but they need resource, financial fairies. They have to get a financial thing for them to start to work. Otherwise, they can tell me, how can I teach them if I haven't got uh, uh, pens or whiteboard or something, because they're growing in environment like so you think the priority is really to get money? To get money first. Yeah, money is important. And most of the teachers, they yeah. go to private teaching, because they <laughs> said if they do private teaching in the afternoon, mm. they might get six or three. Someone told yeah. me I get eight million Sudanese, which is like many, 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 many times than my salary at yeah. the school. Yeah. So in the school, his salary is maybe two million or three million. Yeah. In just private teaching in homes or something, he can get eight, nine million. Yeah. So that's why he, he ran away from early as possible, three yeah. o'clock, two o'clock and so on. Yeah. Financial, yeah, because I'm, okay. I'm a parent's governor at the okay. primary school. You know that I'm being in a finance uh, the committee. The child, it cost for the, in a primary school, nearly 4,000 for a year. If I look for 4,000 per child per school. Mm -hmm. And financial is a very important and the curriculum, because our children or a teacher, I believe now in other curriculum, not if I'm going back to Sudan and I want to teach, I can't teach with the same thing in the, which I'm growing or the same thing now, the ways of the um, teaching. Definitely I have a new idea, teaching, play, using the other um, uh, teacher style. I have to use the three things because everyone has a new, his own need, style. So definitely I will have a new idea. So curricul financial, curriculum, ways to resource. So a lot of things they have to work all together to have uh, good outcomes of education.
Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Do you want anyone? Yes, who wants to come second? Yes. If you come here, it will just be good for him to record. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I just wanted to add to what uh, Mona said that um, indeed we, uh, we need more um, international uh, influence. Uh, I feel the education system in Sudan is dated. I have my own experience actually. I worked for nearly two years um, with an organization that ran um, young professional development. So similar to what we call graduate schemes here. And what I found was that graduates would come out of um, education, university, and they would have absolutely no um, transferable skills. They have um, amazing knowledge um, and they seem to uh, do their own research, so they don't base it on the books that they read. They have, uh, they go online, they do their own research, but they don't ha know how to implement it. They don't have any work skills. And I spent a lot of time um, just developing st simple things like basic uh, business English, um, things such as negotiation skills, communication skills. Um, and all the graduates that I had, I had about 20 graduates, um, they all went on to work very well, went on to do master's degrees. Um, I'm still in touch with them and they, they all come back to me, even now, five years later, and say, you know, just that year that I spent with you changed my life. Um, so I think it's really important to talk about, you know, capacity building, that like people can go back and support education in Sudan um, and develop it. It's not, uh, it's not, What's the word? Um, we 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 can't we don't we we can't give up on the education system. We just need to improve it. So there's potential for it. I remember in Sudan when she was with us. We are one of those. She referred to them about English, because you 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 think your yes. Arabic is not very good. Yes. How did you find that a big challenge for you? Because um, at first it was a big challenge. Uh, ha ha actually, my organization um, everything was done in English. So the IT system, everything, um, sort of, uh, the training itself is in English. Um, and we told them from the beginning that we will only speak to them in English. So we'll only, all the programs, all the development will be in English. So they had to adjust. Um, but for me, living in Sudan, yes, it's difficult. It's not easy. It, it, everything um, requires you to uh, be very patient and change who you are um, to adjust because here we live very fast paced um, or in a fast we work in a fast paced environment but there it's it's not exactly like that it's the complete opposite actually okay. um, and in terms of my Arabic I felt that my Arabic improved so I got some benefits out of it um, I never used to be able to speak I never used to be confident in speaking Arabic and now I'm more confident when I go and, and stay there so there are benefits to me as, for me as well. I don't know enough about the education system in Sudan for me to actually make a comparison or a comment. Yeah. So I'm, I'm here in, in very much a sort of listening and learning capacity as well. And based on what I hear that from, from others, uh, then that will determine how I think I could help with my experience uh, and my expertise. Uh, hence the very first question that I asked you because I, I found that quite surprising that uh, an education institute or facility would not even have something as basic as toilets. As toilet, yeah. it's, it's, it's pretty much standard over here. So that's something that I think is one of the priorities that we need to work on. Interesting to hear what uh, Mona and May said before uh, in terms of an exchange kind of program between students going to Sudan. So um, I'm suggesting uh, and people have suggested to me that we organize some kind of Anglo-Sudanese center over there in Khartoum, uh, where people from who's lived here for a long time or born in this country can go over there uh, and to start to engage with the local communities that are there. Um, really cool. Actually, I agree definitely with uh, Mona and uh, May about what they say. But the main thing in education is the environment. Okay. If they don't have environment, you don't have any education. And as you said before, in, in, in England, the top thing is the teacher. In Sudan, the teacher is nothing now, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, you have to make an environment better 
because now you can have a, a flat in the school, private school. Yes. yes. Just a flat, two bed, two room or three bedroom. They call it school. Um, how can be school? Uh, I'm not going to add about curriculum because Muna she said enough. I'm to, going to talk about the uh, Nida Sudan or the call of Sudan to uh, fundraising to make the school better. Yes. Uh, I think this one is easily can be done uh, or already been done on a lot, a lot of uh, cities, as you said, in Madani. Yes. They graduate from the school of Madani. Yes. They uh, uh, collect money and they grow their school. For their school, yes. And uh, the, uh, we have one in Amiria, Amiria, uh, Umdurman. Yes. They already have the form and they suggest about, they need about a million, uh, one million to improve the, the school. I think we can do this one easily through the WhatsApp, uh, sorry, uh, Facebook, and um, what do you call it, uh, the media. So the new generation, they talking all the, about the media. You can do that, uh, you always have like YouTube and you uh, so that need knowledge, and you do this one. Uh, the curriculum, the only thing I'm going to talk about is the special need. Yes. In Sudan, there is no special need at all. Yes. In the school, in our days, uh, people, they have uh, problem with reading, writing. We call them, unfortunately, I'm going to use the Arabic word, is Bali, or the Arabic school. Yes. He's not. He hasn't got the, the good environment. He has to be in different school, not in the main school, because he has to have special need. And he's going to graduate, he's not graduate, he's going to be in the street, unfortunately. The, Second thing, all the students in Sudan, they want to study as a medical or a lawyer. Yes. Other than that, you are not get any education. You said greater uh, zira is culture of faculty. But most of the people, they don't go to it at all. If you go to zira, I said, oh, you're not going to study nothing. No future. No future. <laughs> and in fact, Sudan is an agricultural country. You have a million, uh, one million uh, we need, we need to grow things. How many medical students we graduate each year? Do we need all of them? No. Most of them, they are not having a job now. They, they have, a, have a reksha or a mjad or... Yes. Because there is no good... Uh, the the um, working market, they don't need them. We have to have education to need our, what we need to, uh, to build our country. Well, just to add to this one, one of the things we discussed with the minister, and he also liked the idea, which is, we said to him exactly what Gizuli said to him, every single school in the country, Darfur, North, West, whatever, the graduate of that school, that's what we did in Medan in our school, the graduate of that school, they are already doing it, but if you or Hamdouk or someone really go to the TV and make a very strong articulated talk, People will be ask people to be more structured, so for accountability, for the benefit of that. And every single school in Sudan, despite the lack of implementation of regulation, is still associated to one local authority education system. So you already got uh, Ministry of Education affiliate in all cities. So we said to them, these people are already doing it, but the more you make it structured through the government system, so those who are supporting, say, uh, like our school in Madani, it could be much better if. At least we have a map in the Ministry of Education. Uh, this is school in Darfur, whatever it is. They, the group, the contact person is Alam, his mobile number, his son. And then the group should raise to the, uh, to the task by making themselves more transparent, more systematic, more structured. So if I am from that village, I can help. Because I said to him, there is no way, whatever, if the, if the I mean, Prime Minister give you all the money, he is not going to build these schools. So I think that has already been taken. This is the one I said to you, I think it's 2009. Because at that time, Cambridge, they said, and I, I, when they sent me the invitation, I didn't, I thought this is a joke. But I found it's a real thing. And they were discussing, they said, do we give them knowledge and technology or give them basic stuff, give them money to build toilets? Because this is basic, like you said, Muhammad. Well, is I've seen it. I always think that you should look at what you have, look at what you have that is good, right, and then build on it. So going totally away from that to the toilets. So implement and removal of bucket toilets was part of the UN deliverable at 2015. And as you know, 
most countries in Africa didn't deliver on it. Even South Africa didn't deliver on it. And in the end, they've got a company from America to try and help them do that. So I think there's two things about toilets. That in Africa, there are not a lot of toilets full stop. But we have a, a thing about toilet being European toilets. So there's cultural barriers to having European toilets. I know when they tried to implement them in India, people just wouldn't have them. So first we have to say, what do we mean by a toilet? And what should be implemented for a toilet? Because it's a basic necessity, but it might be different for different communities. And so um, I think that's quite important. In Ethiopia, there was a huge problem about toilets, and they actually had a national program of implementation of toilets, um, which were slightly different to the European model, but they did countrywide implementation. So you have to be working with people uh, to do that. So that's the thing about toilets and schools. My other thing is, why is the literacy in Sudan 60% and the literacy in Zimbabwe, which is much poorer, 90%? That's also a cultural barrier. And I think you have to look at what the barrier is to overcome that. The problem in Africa is that we've taken European curriculum and implemented it as though it is the best. And as uh, he was saying, you know, you have to have African solutions for this. You need people or farmers. Do you need to have only teach STEM subjects? Do you need people who want to be a lawyer or a doctor? to be thinking about schools and things that are much more practical. A very important issue is your employability. And I think that was a fantastic program that you did because you need to, you know, communication is the really important thing about employability. And if your students don't have that, no matter how good they are when they come out of university, they're not going to get a job. So you need to start training towards employability and you have to go back for your schooling. And the big thing is to put governance and a framework. So I agree with you that at a national level there has to be a, a framework that everyone is implemented and everyone buys into. And those governance around the school, how they work, how they implement the curriculum, at every level that needs to be implemented. I'm sure it's all there, okay, but you simply need to find what's good and then, which they will be, and implement it. And the other thing is, we always forget it's the people. So if whether it's health or education, you're not going to get anything you do not get buy-in from your staff. Okay, so the staff is really important. They have to have a voice. And then the students, even though we don't like it, need to have a voice as well. If you have those two things and you have strong governance structures around it, then you're going to be successful. I mean, yes. you are successful because, you know, the Royal College of Surgeons has a very strong program with you. Mm -hmm. You have the most doctors qualifying, and most of them go abroad to the Middle East. Why is it? Why can't people don't stay at home? Why are there not more people training for what you need in Sudan? And, and, and I think you can address those things importantly. And use different modalities. So if you don't have a school, how expensive it is it going to be to 
build, was it 600 schools? He said he needs to build at least, according to the limited information he got, 64,000, I think, uh, classrooms. Okay. 64,000 classrooms and literacy 60%. Less than that in Zimbabwe, 90%. There's a whole load of other strategies you could use. Uh, you could use GPS, you could use broadband, you can use mobile broadband, or you could be teaching anywhere in the rainy season. They can go into government buildings. You know, it's, you just move it to accommodate uh, uh, your society. And, and the model from Zimbabwe that we implemented that they can be into school, Doing broadband here. Okay, you haven't got books, but you can have slates. Okay, uh, you can implement that. And when I was head of school year in the university, I took it, so I took the teaching out into the community, which actually formed the basis for our English training. Zimbabwe, you mentioned that, and um, I know Robert Mugabe divided opinion, but that will be part of his legacy, is that he did make education a priority. So it wasn't always 90%. And he actually got that model of improving literacy in the country from Cuba. And Cuba had, uh, I think it was a literacy rate of like 40%, and it went from 40 to 90 in a short space of time because they made literacy a priority in the country. Yes. Who else next? Anyone on the education? Maybe the volunteering, because this volunteering, I know, is an issue because of the language. I mean, and also we know that lots of uh, youngest, even we met them in Sudan, from our boys and girls who were in the march, in the uprising, all of them, they went to Sudan. And I can see that the, 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 we can benefit from them if they can speak in Arabic. They can teach physics, chemistry, whatever it is. So any other suggestion? I give it for the front I think it's better to be with uh, Ahmed, Ahmed Badri program. Because yes. already existing and has been working for 20 years. Yes. As you have a say, Sudan, if you want to destroy anything, uh, form a community. Or yes. It's better <laughs> to uh, working with them. The thing is already existing. Already. Well, like this is what the just idea to them. And I think this is exactly what we t we're going to be advocating in the next two, three weeks. <laughs> I just came very ill. But I said to Ahmed Bedri, this particular task, I know you used to do it for universities, not schools, mm -hmm. but even he responded positively, and he will do it on Wednesday. We said to him, why not we all, not us here in the knowledge of the university, all initiative to support you in what you've already been doing well. Yeah. The Queen acknowledged it. And you have been doing it genuinely without any political or any fire, anything is a charity. Yeah. So if, by, if all we support that scheme, yeah. and if all we empower people like Muna to help in the education, because I can tell you one said to me, inside the British Council, I wouldn't uh, t uh, mention the exact name of that initiative, but because it's sensitive. The advisor, the British Council, I mean, I'm on record now, uh, they have an associate professor from the University of Khartoum, they employ her as a consultant for the British Council. And she said that to me inside, Mervyn was with me in the meeting. She said, there's too much of things which we think they are not relevant. And I gave me, she gave me an example of an education initiative they invited to attend with the minister himself, maybe he can talk to you on Wednesday, completely provided by people who have nothing to do with education. Education initiative Nothing, absolutely nothing, not in their profession or in their experience. Do you see what I mean? And they, she said to me, that's from the start, Alam doesn't fit, from the start. I can understand I'd, uh, be, uh, b academia from faculty of education, they are promoting an initiative for education. I can understand teachers like uh, Mona and others. But from the start, she said to me, I found it very strange. But then I went, she said to try to understand. And this is a problem I think we all face it, by the way. We are not organized, the professionals, and the ones they are looking for us. While we were in Sudan, while we were there, Muna and Mamai were there, every day when I go at night to my bed, before I, I just look into the uh, Facebook, I can either find or found out in, on the, in the morning there was a conference. Sometimes the conference was in the same friendship hall which we were there. <laughs> by another group, whether we're American, from other country, whatever, without mentioning countries, or there is something tomorrow. 
We don't know about them, they don't know about us, or maybe we know about each other. So this is a big problem. The flux of us giving them, if we, we are not organizing it, it will, it, will, uh, it will be of no use. And their, their capacity to absorb all this is almost zero. They don't have anyone who is responsible in the ministry to listen to Alam or listen to this. There's so many flux. But I think, uh, uh, yes, I, I, I agree <coughs> if we can take this, um, the volunteering of Ahmed Badri as an example, and we apply that to all other initiatives. I think health, that's what comes to her education now. So many, in, in Sudan, I met five, five groups doing with health, five. Exclude uh, while uh, the Cambridge one, five. All initiated by doctors, consultants from America, from UK, whatever it is. And uh, they are doing initiative. Imagine I am the Minister of Health and you're giving me all this. I will meet Allah, okay, I take from you. And I, I imagine they don't have what I found with all ministers, which is very interesting. Here, when you meet a, CIA, or a decision maker, the most important person, I have said this many times. And one day I had a picture with uh, Cameron, uh, what's his name, uh, David Cameron, from a plane. When he was just getting off the plane on the, uh, what, what do you call that? Thing? <laughs> there was a girl, his, his top BA is a girl. Yeah, go, Cameron, his top BA was a girl, a, a woman. <coughs> she sneaked because she doesn't go through the protocol, you know. The, the, the. She sneaked and she ran out quickly so she can get out. And I said to them, this lady, she earned, I can't remember, four or five hundred thousand, yes, almost half a million. But if, God, if, if David, Bo, uh, David Cameron turned, uh, and he said, how many schools in the UK we have? She will answer him. How many are these? Top, top. This is the most important people. All the ministers I met, they don't have even a single one of them. Mm -hmm. You meet them in the meeting. All the people are us from Germany, Sheikh Babikir. No one from the ministry just taking notes. All of them. And that's basic. Imagine the recording we did because we didn't have to come back to him to record. There's no one to take notes with the ministers. Ministers, all of them, and you have the tea, coffee, all kinds of nice juice, everything. No admin there to take notes. So how would they retain the information? Excellent. So this is, a, this is one of their basic. But the problem, I think what we can do, there is many people told me, if we push too much of these visits, like you go and talk, talk is better, tell them how important this basic stuff. A BA is most important than anything for a minister. Number one. You, he must have a BA with him writing notes and who is Alam, taking contact details, number. The basic thing I start when I learn, they said to me, don't go to any place, Alam. When I was trained in a marketing in Scotland, without leaving with a contact number. Imagine now, don't go home without having contact of all these people. Imagine you go to a ministry and you leave, no one knows where, is, where to reach you. So we will go. Anyone else on the education before we go to higher education? Safe. Uh, everything, everywhere, every venue, every government, department, institution, you name it. But the good thing is, um, when I heard the uh, nomination of Professor Muhammad al Amin at home as uh, for the uh, post of Minister of Education, I was very pleased. Why? Because Professor Muhammad al Amin at home is one of a very few. Uh, University of Khartoum professors who has dedicated a, uh, um, a lot of time of his own time in researching and uh, uh, publishing and writing and exploring on issues uh, that relates to education and higher education and that's why when in his first um, uh, press conference, he stunned people by the data and information he presented to people. People expected him to talk about, we found this and uh, the destruction here and there, but he spoke with figures, he spoke with his statistics. Everybody was, was shocked of the reality of the situation. I'm sure we will um, listen to him when we see him, if we are lucky to see him on Wednesday. He will tell us about what he's found now. Uh, having spent almost three months in the situation, uh, obviously he's going to tell us what he has seen, what he has found, and uh, also he will tell us what he is planning to do, and probably will ask us, what do you think of this idea, or this or that, 
and then we will have the chance to uh, give our humble advice uh, to him and Professor Sairoun as well. But um, as I said at the beginning, the assuring thing, the Ministry of Education is in good hands. Let us hope that with his knowledge, he can turn the situation. But this can not be easily done in isolation. The entire system is damaged. And uh, I don't want to be pessimistic to say that the damage is beyond repair. It can be repaired, but it needs really hard, hard work and efforts. Improving education in Sudan is, is a project, is a big project. And it, it must be started correctly. Now, to, to handle a situation like this, in my view, you need to have a strategic plan. Uh, you need to have vision and mission, first of all, and, and then from there set your strategic plan. It's no good to work in isolation or isolated islands. I know people like yourself, Professor Hanan, many, many. other people, where everybody tries to work, but everybody is working maybe with a different group that doesn't know what the other group is doing. So we working systematically using strategic plans is the way forward. The benefit of this is you channel all the efforts in one direction. You use your resources wisely. You avoid the duplication of work and uh, uh, wasting of resources and conflict of interests. So this is the benefit of, of working systematically through strategic plan. Um, from your strategic plan, you identify what needs to be done. It could be more than just a curriculum and uh, ideas and uh, volunteers. It could be ma many other things that need to be done. Uh, so working through a strategic plan help you to identify what need to be done. And, and then the next stage is to evaluate the current situation and identify the gap. Yeah. Uh, before acting and setting what need to be your actions, obviously, uh, you need to look into to the gap and, and find out what need to be done. And then, before acting, you try to use your uh, uh, what, what's knowledge available to you, like we're talking about here. Using benchmarking is one of the tools that could be very helpful here. Look around you. See what countries have been through this situation, what they did. Try to use their knowledge and uh, they, what they gain. Because you, sometimes you do not need to reinvent the wheel. Many problems in this life could have been already sorted by other people. So you need to use that experience. Uh, you need to use uh, the experts. We talked about, um, uh, we mentioned some names of people who has good knowledge in this country and other countries. Yeah. Uh, and then these are the resources you can use and the volunteers. So to me, this is the uh, uh, critical. For, for improving uh, education in Sudan, it, it need to be uh, the task need to be started right. It need to be pl planned well. We need to have a framework to help us to get where we want to be. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hamid. Well, this is very good, important point, and let me use it now so we will not come back. But I want to say the, the proposal I gave to four or five ministers, and I would like to sh show it with you. Maybe you can expand it. Maybe. The European Union, just because I, 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 the European Union, they, every commissioner will appoint advisory group. Every commissioner. Let's take the commissioner is the minister. But to avoid that, I said to him, to avoid all this, your excellency ministers, choose them on a very simple criteria. They have knowledge and expertise on the task you want. So if you want for engineering, you need to get the engineers 
who got good knowledge on strategy and planning. Not very good architects, whatever it is. It doesn't going to, they're not going to help you. The same like in academia. Not every academic can help you with the policy of the institutions, but he, any academic, he can tell you how to write or to do a curriculum development, any academic, because that's part of his training. The same thing for doctors. Not all doctors, they understand the policy, they understand the Sergio and whatever it is. So the best thing, every, every ministry, to have an advisory committee, publicly, transparently, announced, give them four weeks, everyone can submit, you submit, I submit, anyone from Saudi, anyone, and then to be evaluated by completely independent bodies. So you can find friends like uh, Farida, long experience in advising government, she could, you need two, three people in each field, completely independent, we can find hundreds, American, British, so just independent. They will say to you, out of these 200 experts submitted, these are the best 10 based on our knowledge. And then these 10, give them, empower them. What I mean by that, like you said, Muna. Muna can go, and I can go. You go, all of you, like, while all the people, they went there. But you need to empower them, number one, by announcing publicly to the public, those are the people I selected to help the Ministry of Education. And I'm giving you example. I was advising in the European Commission. They, 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 they leave the list for all the, for many years. This was 2006. And if you click, I think the link might be there. Maybe I lost the link. I don't know. But if you, if you click, you still find the list of the people. So no one from the UK will say, why did you choose Alam? They will say to him, there are many better than Alam, but at least Alam was at that time good enough to do the task we want. We were two of us. But that doesn't mean we are the two best in the whole UK to advise the international society. You have to choose people at the end. But to look for, this comes to me through Alam, this comes through, it will not work. That's the big problem. If we don't solve it right now, I think the government cannot do anything. Investment, education, health, waste management, everything. They have to do it quickly. The problem which I found in these three weeks, you don't know how to challenge this discussion to whom. Do you give it to the prime minister? Uh, the minister themselves, they are struggling to, to reach prime minister. I'm sorry to say this in, in record, yes. He tried to contact the prime minister for two days. He couldn't get through to him. Imagine a minister can't reach a prime minister. Whom to challenge his role, Hurriya or Taghir, I don't know. Who really can listen to this and understand this is the only way to advise government? And I remember at Sussex, we had a colleague of mine. His title is a professor. He was telling us that the science of advising government. Advising government is a science. People. So this is, I think, if we all work on this one, I think it will help. Let's all people across the world come together, filter them, and probably in the engineering you have six, five categories. One of these categories is those who have a good knowledge on policy. And then when it comes to structural engineering, maybe to implementation, there's another people. And that's what I tried. I discussed this with many engineers when I was there from Qatar and so on. And I said to them, engineers, I am not engineer, but engineers, there are different categories. Some of them, for example, in, in, if I need to advise in medical education, there are people who are doing medical education. They are teaching medical education. They are much more relevant than other, for example, experts. So I think uh, this is a very good point, Muhammad. Wallahi, what I want, if we can, at least through these two ministers, and I think there's another the lady who we're going to watch her today, uh, investment, director of investment. She is in town, I think. Today she, got a, she had a talk. If we can challenge it through three, four ministries, I have, I have the contact to the Ministry of Interior, so they can build advisory board on real advising or advisory experience, and then they can take it for, forward. And then you make this committee public, transparent. They are not getting paid. They just travel. They meet every three months, and they will help the minister. But everyone, we stick to them, and every new initiative will go through them. I think that will help. Now, I think we need to go to the higher education. Right. Uh, I tell you the story behind this. Uh, I, I was working on uh, a research about uh, manufacturing and industrial and the industry in Sudan. Um, I came back from Sudan last week. And uh, one of the outcomes of this uh, research an investigation was uh, uh, something related to education. So let, let, me, let me take you through this. Um, 
uh, as you know, uh, in the New Sudan, we're seeking to, to um, improve our economy. And one of the ways to improve economy is through uh, uh, improving production, industrial and agricultural. Uh, at the moment, the situation of the industry in Sudan is, is, doesn't look great. So for us to improve uh, in the industry or manufacturing, uh, we need effective industrial strategy. We need efficient operation capabilities, but we also need good education. And one of the findings of this research is that uh, manufacturing and industrialization are lacking people with industrial engineering knowledge. And this is critical. If we think about improving production, especially in the industry, we need to have uh, people who has the knowledge to do that. Uh, so one of the findings of the research is that there is shortage of people with good knowledge of industrial engineering. Uh, I won't go through this, but just for you, for your knowledge, when we talk about industrial engineering, we're talking about factories, the knowledge you need to run a factory efficiently. Yeah? This is this, what industrial engineering is all about. Uh, so these are just examples of uh, industrial <coughs> engineering operations. Another findings, which is uh, also found by another, I, it is found during my research, but also it is cited somewhere by somebody, uh, is that there is lack of quality control in the uh, Sudanese industry. Yeah, there is a good knowledge, and this is also can be taken as an evidence that there is. Uh, 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 need for education uh, or a shortage of education in, in industrial engineering because quality in general, quality control, quality assurance is one of the focus areas of industrial engineering. Uh, I won't go through these slides because obviously I've got five minutes, uh, but I, I'll just skip to the most important ones. Why we need industrial engineering is this, it, 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 one of the things, it, it, it makes manufacturing most profitable sector, and as we know, as you all know that, factories in Sudan in the past few years has been closing because manufacturing hasn't been a profitable business. They can't make money because of some policies and because of different things. So industrial engineering is, is seeking to do this. Uh, both support of um, uh, 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 manufacturing uh, products. So w w with that, we will be able to compete in, in, in an international market if we are good in that. Otherwise, we won't be able to compete. Uh, provide competitive edge for Sudanese products in, in the global market. Uh, attract investment reduce cost of, of living for locals, again. So uh, this is why we think this is important. Uh, but the conclusion is, is this, that the Sudanese industry is lacking important principles and knowledge of industrialization and manufacturing techniques. And that due to the fact that we're having good, good uh, education system uh, in uh, industrial engineering, and we need that. Uh, recommendation is uh, the Ministry of Education, together with the Ministry of Industry, they need to work together to establish good base for uh, industrial engineering, because this is critical for both for the economy and for the industry. And the uh, other recommendation is that the Industrial Research Institute, this is the most important one, but the Industrial Research Institute in Sudan has a critical role to play in, in this, and that is working with the Ministry of Education 
to establish a, 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 a curriculum, to establish a foundation for industrial engineering. Uh, and uh, that is what needs to be done. And I hope this message you get to the right people, Ministry of Higher Education and Ministry of Industry, that we are lacking knowledge, we're lacking, uh, there is a big gap here. And, and we need to do something about it. Recommendations also, uh, if it comes to identify the curriculum, we can help on this definitely with our knowledge uh, <coughs> uh, as being uh, lecturing in this field, as being uh, working for o o over 20 years in the industry, uh, knowing the techniques and what needs to be done and what is the gap. So, that is something we can help for, but at this stage we need the message to get to the right people and uh, as soon as we get a green light that yes, we want to do this, we offer our help. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to Queen's Mary this morning. And it's been a pleasure as I graduated from this university a couple of years ago. So thank you very much, and I uh, would like to uh, talk about a, a project um, in five minutes. So I'll try to be very fast. As you can see in the screen, the uh, uh, project is uh, titled Sudan um, Health Library uh, or Sudan Learning Management System Initiative. And uh, the running title is, uh, is an innovative way to support uh, teaching and learning in health sciences in Sudan. I'm, uh, by the way, Dr. Abu Bakr Shaddad. I'm a consultant <coughs> physician and gastroenterologist working in East London. And um, I thought of this project when I was working at the National University of Ireland. And this is a picture of our campus at that time. I worked there as a lecturer in medicine for four years. And uh, the actual uh, idea arised, uh, or arose from the um, the, the, the recent expansion over the last decade or so uh, in the number of the health uh, education uh, facilities in Sudan hasn't been met with uh, parallel support uh, in terms of uh, provision of um, educational resources and infrastructure, which created a very difficult situation for many of the students and um, practitioners alike. So we thought of uh, an innovative way to try and bridge the gap and introduce an interface which could bring um, different parts of the Sudan in one um, uh, learning hub, if you want to call it, that could uh, provide some modern um, uh, learning resources. Uh, this would also have the benefit of um, unifying or um, reducing the difference in the curriculum between different institutions around the, the country. And um, obviously it will uh, cover the gap in the short uh, shortage and the lack of um, educational resources. With the um, old uh, ideas in mind, uh, in the past people used to buy books and carry them, textbooks. Uh, nobody, um, we know all that, nobody read textbooks these days. And with the advancing technology of the internet and also the availability of a smartphone and devices which can access the internet, um, that uh, create this model is a, um, a possible way to go through it. So we thought of the, um, what you call it, VLE, Virtual Learning Environment, or uh, LMS, whatever you like, uh, Learning Management System. Um, we have uh, gone further to um, think of what we can provide through this to our um, students, researchers, and undergraduate and postgraduate students in health sciences, all health sciences, medicine, nursery, midwifery, dentistry, and all, all, all related um, subjects and uh, disciplines. I'm going to skip these few slides. Uh, we had a kind of a, a very thorough um, search for different models. 
blackboard was very expensive model is is really um, affordable and model stand for modular object orientated dynamic learning environment um, we we thought model would be the best um, model to use because it is free of charge however the cost of um, IT support uh, hosting all of this security is there and we went and we have done the um, at that time we were targeting these institutions uh, to link them out we thought of the project funding we got some fund initially uh, to link up some kind of databases and um, um, resources for the um, uh, education like um, Oxford um, Ham Book of Medicine series, up to date uh, British BNF and all this type of um, standard learning um, resources for um, health sciences. If you want, um, we um, we come across a very very um, uh, generous uh, people actually in different institutions around around i was in ireland at that time and in the uk as well who willing to help and we end up by um kind of developing the the uh, library itself and actually it it, sta it sta started you know and we were testing it but unfortunately we couldn't find the appropriate support from the end user uh, side from sudan although we had to discuss this with different institutions over there but we couldn't uh, finally to get it into operation so the idea is still here and we're aiming with the new spirit in in sudan to try to revisit this option and push it forward the um, final thing that i want to say that benefit of such um, unifying interface would be provision of resources creating a learning community um, and the aspect of learning community is a big in the academia. Academic people know this. And <coughs> linking students with the expert from inside Sudan, outside Sudan. And I think the, the benefit of this will be um, um, many. Um, I almost finished what I wanted to say. Some challenges are uh, expected. Uh, people should be ready for it. Like... Um, most of our university and institutions, they don't have uh, a very robust IT system or intranet that could securely um, provide access to this. And you cannot leave a such big uh, library um, without any kind of um, security system. Um, but um, <coughs> the long story can be um, started I, I won't forget some people who helped me a lot during that time, my, our colleagues in the learning technology team in Galway, and um, I, I'm really grateful to their help. But uh, what I can offer now, um, I'm ready with a lot of people who worked in the past in this project with me, I'm ready to, to build the interface, but we need to kind of just the management side of it and the side which is related to Sudan um, has to be organized and uh, linked and we can we can see seriously we can we can achieve this in a very short time thank you very much yeah, have you approached any of the global service uh, internet servers like Google or Microsoft to see what they can do um, I attended a conference recently hosted by Google and they said that they've got big plans for Africa as well. So I think that would be something that you might find beneficial to get in contact with them to see what they can do. Excellent idea. Uh, in fact, the answer is no. We didn't go that far. But we, um, in fact, approach some of the... We are, in fact, approach uh, some of the IT companies back in Sudan, asking them only to provide free internet or Wi-Fi to a um, small kind of hall like this yeah. in one of the hospital, Mustashfa Shab. We, we want to spoke to, uh, sp uh, we've spoken to Zen company and ask them just if you can provide like 10 computers and a Wi-Fi free. So the students who are sitting there or the doctors who's going there to search for something or download a 
PDF or, or, or PowerPoint presentation, they can can use it for free. But um, as you, as you said, um, I think the um, there is a good support um, for such uh, projects internationally. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shadar. But I think there is a, a is antisocial. And for example, in my home, some my call, they said, move from this room to the other room because that is better. I think this is the main thing you have to face it first. And if I'm wrong, Dr. Alam can uh, correct me. I think he initiated that at the library from Sussex or Oxford for $50,000 uh, each thing can access it. The problem is the internet in Sudan, not the internet. The internet in general is very weak. I think there is no people can access this one. This is the first thing. The second thing, even the big uh, organization like University of Khartoum, the dean or the head of the Khartoum, if, if they ask you, can you have an email, you expecting to be dot Khartoum dot you uh, Sudan. They, she give you an email, Gmail or Hotmail. I think this is the main thing. And good luck for the project. Yes. Actually, the, the, infra uh, the infrastructure is, uh, is weak. This is one. But also the culture is also not there. Mm. Still people need to. But we have to. This is part of the process. <laughs> I think we should prove the form of that. So That's right. Actually, I think it's brilliant. And we have to rely on the young people. Whatever we think here, every kid in Africa has a phone, right? And you don't have to go through Google or one of these uh, multinationals who immediately own all your data. You can use, um, I can talk to you about using satellite, okay? And with the, with the $50 phone, all right? you can access uh, data. So we provide satellite connections uh, for education and health with cheap phones, okay? I know the internet, you know, even in South Africa, you in one room and there's no internet, you go to the other room. So the coverage there isn't very good, right? And it depends on who's supplying it. But actually, if you work on a satellite, with cheap friends, you'll be able to do it. It's a brilliant idea, yeah, yeah. It's a brilliant idea to use a platform, okay, and use a virtual VLE, and people can take their talk there. Okay. Uh, just to uh, continue from that, the as a company, we went through an Indian company um, who built the platform that we used um, and the students or the, uh, the trainees would access that platform. So we didn't go through a massive company like Google. We just picked a company. We went through uh, different bids and we picked a company from India. So there are companies out there who are not international but are, or are international to, uh, to Sudan um, who are willing to, to do the work uh, and, and lower the cost. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, well, I, I have an argument going on, and I even said the minister uh, said this is not serious, but it's serious. I said to them, no progress. Uh, I mean, Tony Blair said before, no progress in, econ in our economy without science. That's Tony Blair's famous quote in, at Oxford. My quote, I said, <laughs> this is for four years, no progress in Sudan economy without internet. No way, no way the, the economy of Sudan will go a single inch without internet. And the, the, uh, the, the agony is internet is there in Sudan. And the level it is, is good enough to operate a successful country. And the proof is all the private sector. They have excellent Wi-Fi. All companies, Dal, Murud, you go to any of these companies, the best you can communicate, Wi-Fi, everything. Universities and public sector, they are not just putting money to do it. So I requested two years ago, and I'm, if there is one thing, I would be happy if this minister fly on Saturday, accepting to do it, is to issue a declaration or a decree 
No university will be licensed without ensuring a Wi-Fi is in campus, at least on the effective parts. It's not too much, it's not very expensive. They spend too much money on other things. So if a meeting like this, I have seen it in Sudan, in a university, very poor, you will find lots of drinks, food, blah, blah, blah. All this could easily be for one month's subscription to a good uh, broadband, at least to the dean office. Yes, I calculated for them. Many years ago, I was at the University of Khartoum. The, the lunch was half chicken, pasta, fish. Very, very big meal. I said, how much this cost? They didn't know why I'm calculating. I said, the cost of this could have paid for them to give you Wi-Fi in this building. They don't have it. You struggle. And if you see the live broadcast from uh, the Friendship Hall, everything we did was perfect, except the sound. It keeps dropping because you can't do anything. The guy who was doing the live, he was four SIM cards from then, Canar, whatever it is. So if this drop, the other one will take drop again. So anyway, internet, I, for you medical people, I mentioned like the cannula, you know, the one you did here. If you don't get this cannula, there is no way you will get one. So I think we will try to push with both of them if they can make a case, the government, at least the government office. And Gizuli is right. Minister, they give you an email, which is Yahoo or what is it, uh, Gmail. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for um, this invitation and thank you for the opportunity to come and present. It's always a, um, <clears throat> a delight to come back to Tokyo Mary University of London because I did my master's in clinical endocrinology here about a few years ago. So it's always a delight to come back. So my name is Wal Bashari and this is my colleague Ahmed. We, we worked in the University of Cambridge um, uh, Clinical School and um, we've uh, capitalized on a, um, uh, a collaborative effort between the, the University of Khartoum uh, medical school and the, the, uh, the, the clinical school at the University of Cambridge and we will try and show you what we've done so far. <coughs> so we've got no conflicts of interest to declare. Part of how this started was to do with, um, with the status of our institutions in Sudan. We both graduated from the same college of medical in, in, in Khartoum and uh, people who are interested in international um, institutions ranking would, would realize that uh, Sudan is not doing very well as you can see. Um, and um, the United Nations' very uh, latest uh, um, 17 SDGs and um, the Times um, ranking system actually uh, involves and, and, and um, capitalizes on the uh, international reputation, international collaboration between institutions and uses it as a, a, a parameter to, to, um, to rank universities internationally. So we thought we would help uh, some of our institutions by, by this uh, by this partnership, and um, obviously this is w w what we um, um, working upon our uh, SDG three, which is uh, good health. This is where we come from. We're we're, we're both uh, from the health sector, and the global partnership from SDG seventeen and so on. So um, just a quick word on uh, on the collaborative ecosystem and how we think that um, this should work. From an international institution like where, where we are at the minute, we uh, can can help and work with in, in, a, in an international friendship between another in institution somewhere else, Sudan as an example in this case. And uh, once you identify the targeted institutions, then you can um, uh, start by initiating visits and do subsequent visits, visits between the two institution, institutions, built on a, an, an a, me on a medium that's uh, welcoming for, for both institutions have the manpower and resources that are from the institutions, for instance, in Cambridge, or um, uh, like Professor Farida said, um, uh, resources already available there in Sudan that we can capitalize on, infused staff, internet, education, soft skills, data, etc., and then publication, which should then um, help your cause. Um, so in this very, very brief talk, we've divided into categories of um, uh, projects that we've done in Khartoum and projects that we've done in Cambridge. And I'll let my colleague Ahmed describe to you some, some of the projects that we've, uh, we've performed in, in, in the uh, two institutions in due course. Thank you, Wael. Um, so yeah, we try to capitalize on both uh, projects on both sides in Khartoum and in Cambridge. And the main thing that was started from from background of medical education that we want to know what are the learning needs for the students first. So for all the students in the University of Khartoum Medical School, we kind of 
kind of divided a survey to all the students and we got a feedback from 700 students who all kind of replied to us. We gave them a free text just to write down what do they think they need to be taught on. And we tried to analyze all these data. It looks a little bit uh, difficult to interpret now, but we, we used the word clone to see what are the most kind of repetitive words that we can teach them on. As you can see that they're kind of asking us to share, that, uh, to share knowledge uh, medical research experience and the most striking ones are clinical skills. So, th so, th so we thought how we can go back home and we can teach them on the thing they need the most as they ask us to do so. So we started by doing teaching them basically lectures on the things that they wanted to do from how to study for exams, how to do undergraduate um, kind of sort of research basics and how to do uh, clinical examinations and how to capitalize on the knowledge in the basic medical knowledge that they need. And we went to the clinical level by doing closed tutorials. And we kind of um, enlist the help from our friends and um, colleagues in, um, in uh, medical school in Cambridge. Uh, and they, we went there through, um, through two years to deliver those sort of um, lectures and tutorials for medical students, small group tutorials as well as we kind of took um, some of the students we went to rural areas to provide not only um, medical education experience but also a charity experience for people who need the treatment the most. So we can use that as a platform to teach the medical student through a real life experience. And we collected the feedback from the student afterward through the things that we, we the basics of uh, knowledge in, in, uh, in medicine, from neuro neurological examination, <coughs> taking history, communication skills with, um, with patients. So we tried to get pre and post confidence level for each category of those uh, se separate um, kind of things. And as you can see on the left hand side on this Likert scale, you can see the confidence level before and on, in blue you can see that confidence level after. And there is a shift in, um, um, in the confidence level for all students. For the second leg, we selected uh, some students from there to come to Cambridge to do um, a kind of educational program. A total of six students. Uh, we structured kind of clinical observership program for them. Uh, as well as uh, presenting kind of in conferences for all the experience and all the research data we collected through our experience there. And we designed also sort of lectures to, impl uh, to improve the soft skills and communication skills and to teach them how to um, have a side vision not only for the medical work but also how to develop in, in, at a personal level. Um, and uh, most of all, as Weil mentioned, we tried to do all this effort in a joint kind of publication between University of Khartoum and Cambridge. And the first five names that you see on this publication are actually students, the youngest of them in the second year of medical school in Sudan, along with uh, very renowned educators from Cambridge as well in the same thing. And we tried to reflect this as a model that not only used in Sudan, but all in the develop in all developing countries throughout the world, and it's available not in desks in offices and things, but so available online, and we publish that uh, so everyone can access that throughout the world. And back to why. Thank you, Ahmed. So, um, what we'd like to conclude by saying is, international collaboration helps in uh, the development of each institution, both uh, in both countries. It uh, generates good reputation for the institution, particularly in the uh, developing country, for instance, Sudan in this, in this instance. And students and staff in, in institutions in Sudan do need opportunities. So this, this helps them by, by getting them into opportunities. We, they, they've networked with visitors from, from, from the UK. It was a great experience for, for both uh, sides as well. We do require, we do require enthused permanent staff to, to ensure the sustainability of this project. The environment setup is very, very much needed to ensure the swift del delivery. Funding is very important, like everyone, say, everyone said from our previous colleagues. And we would want to ex uh, maximize the use of available potential resources as well. I know we've, we've run out of time already, but we'd like to show you a video of somebody who, who um, wanted to share, a, 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 a YouTube blogger, who wanted to share his, his um, um, experience with, with everybody. He's a graduate from the University of Cambridge. Uh, he's a doctor with us who um, um, some, some of you may know. 
So earlier this year, me and a group of doctors from Cambridge traveled to Sudan for a medical mission trip with a team of Sudanese doctors, healthcare professionals and medical students from Khartoum University, we set up six medical clinics in villages in northern Sudan. This is the Sudan Medical Adventure. Day one, we arrive in Khartoum and head to a restaurant in the city centre. Welcome to Sudan. This is our first day in the trip. We've all just landed and we're having our first organisational team meeting with the rest of the doctors. Everyone say hello. We drive through the city, across the River Nile, to our host family's house. The Nile apparently runs the entire length of the country pretty much, so we'll be seeing it at various different points in our journey. This is very exciting. And then get demolished at FIFA by some medical students before heading to bed. Day two, we wake at the crack of dawn and head to Khartoum University Medical School with boxes full of drugs and other medical supplies. All right, so this here is our box of drugs and syringes and things. They've came from um, different companies. They have supported us with some financial support. We make friends with some of the students there who treat us to some traditional Sudanese food. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, those are nice. And then we load up the bus and join the 75 students and 20 doctors, lab technicians and pharmacists and head 500 kilometers north to Meroe. So we're about halfway through the journey. We've been driving for the last four hours and all there is around us is just desert. After eight hours of driving through the desert, we arrive at the resort, debrief and head to our room. Wow, look at this. Yes, mate. Oh, we've got a balcony as well. Isn't that really pretty? It's going to be a solid spot to fly the drone from tomorrow morning. Day three is when the fun really starts. We split up into three teams, each with 25 medical students and a handful of doctors and lab technicians. My team drives an hour through the desert to reach a village called Village 5. We set up our clinic at the local primary school and for the rest of the day, the medical students see all of the patients with our team of doctors overseeing the process. All right, so this is the school that we've been in for the past day and here's how the patient flow works. So the patients start off in the triage area over there and that's where they get seen by some of our doctors and some of our fourth year medical students and they take a quick history, do their vital signs, so their pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and kind of triage them as to how urgently they need to be seen. Then, once a patient has been triaged, they get given this form and then get sent to one of the clinic rooms over there or over there. And we've been in these clinic rooms all day, just kind of seeing the patients as they come in, taking a full history, doing an examination, and then some patients just need reassurance and a bit of analgesia. They can get that from the pharmacy, which is over there. We've got a pharmacist, we've got a supply of drugs, but then some patients need further investigations. So then we send them over to our hematology and biochemistry lab that we've got set up. And that's where we can do things like a full blood count, urea electrolytes, uh, urinalysis, fecal analysis, that sort of stuff. And then they come back to the clinic and then we sort them out based on the results of those investigations. So this is actually a pretty great setup. The medical students see the patients and talk to them in Arabic. And then when they're done, they present the case to one of the doctors and we double check the management plan. This means that overall, we provide a really good cost-effective service for patients who don't normally get to see doctors. And at the same time, we're helping train up the medical students in their clinical reasoning and physical examination skills. And rather than just providing a medical and educational service, we also provide some entertainment for the local school children by busting out the drone and letting them play with it a little bit. Day four is our final clinical day, and so our three teams drive to three more villages in northern Sudan. All right, so here we are in the village of Al Bakhik. Uh, we came here this morning, and again, it's the same setup as yesterday. We now have two triage rooms, one for the men and one for the women. And then we've got two clinic rooms that they get triaged into. And then we've got our pharmacy and we've got our lab going on. Overall, it's been pretty chill today. We don't have quite as many patients as we had yesterday. So there was quite a good opportunity to teach some of the medical students. We ran through the cardiovascular, the cranial nerves, the knee examination. And these guys have been really friendly. They cooked food for us, which was very tasty. And they're so generous. They gave us kind of brunch, different types of meat. And there's this kamonia. It's actually sheep intestines. <laughs> so with our bellies comfortably full with sheep intestine, we drive back to the resort to debrief. We get together with the other teams, share some presentations about interesting cases that we'd all seen across the two days, and Roberto's team deliver a performance of a traditional Arabic song for everyone's entertainment. All right, so it's the final day of the trip. We've done our two days of the medical mission, and this morning we spent a couple of hours doing some lectures for the medical students. We did a talk about research methods in medicine, and did a talk about how to prepare for exams, such as the postgraduate medical exams, like the MRCP. And now we're gonna spend the rest of the day just hanging out with the students and the other doctors. At the moment, we're by the River Nile. Is this the Nile. Yeah. And then we're going to head back to Khartoum, which is going to be a fun little bus journey, hopefully see some pyramids on the way, and just, you know, have a nice social bonding experience. So that was our medical adventure in Sudan. Over the five days, we explored some of the beautiful landscape, we saw and treated hundreds of patients who would have otherwise had very limited access to healthcare, and we made friends with some absolutely wonderful pharmacists, technicians, medical students, and doctors along the way. 
thank you for watching. If you'd like to know more about the medical mission, or if you'd like to find out more about how you can get involved with doing cool stuff like this, there's going to be a link in the video description that will give you some more information. If you like the video, please do give it a cheeky thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, then please consider doing so. Have a lovely day, and we'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. I'm really happy to present you my idea about running clinical trial in Sudan using Sudanese honey as a cancer therapy. Um, cancer is one of the major health problems in um, worldwide. So according to a WHO, more than 18 million new cases were diagnosed in 2018 and more than 9 million deaths occur at the same year. Here, um, the number of new cases and death in both Sudan and south of Sudan during 2018. A few years ago, I did research at the Imperial College to study the effect of honey, Sudanese honey, on the cancer cells. Um, according to my uh, results, I've been awarded a UK patent. Um, four years ago, I started to apply honey on the cancer cells, and this is one of the clinical case study. 70 years old women diagnosed with the breast cancer. Uh, according to the lady, the size of the tumor was the si similar size of the mango seed. She refused to take uh, chemo and she used only honey. After eight weeks using honey, as you can see from the picture, the tumor disappeared. And here, comparing between two HISTO reports, early June, January 2018, when she diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. December 2018, the report states unremarkable cells. To have a new results, we need to change our mindset. And therefore, my plan to run a clinical trial in Sudan. And for my requirements, I need approval from the government cancer patients, Sudanese honey, blood test and x-ray to be done, one every three or four months, and a fund. The duration of my clinical trials will last only for one year. And I hope that all of you will help me to save people's life using affordable, no side effects treatment. Thank you very much. Women and use at uh, 70 years. How did she use it? Did she Very good question. Um, I developed a schedule to use two dosage, one early morning between 3 to 4 uh, a.m. and the, after, uh, the second one after uh, during the same set. And she applied outside as well. So she used it orally and outside. But during the one month with my schedule, I started with one tablespoon in the morning, one tablespoon in the evening, and then I gradually up to, uh, to reach five tablespoons for each dosage. <laughs> because I'm talking yes, to you, yes, because yes. I've experienced a lot of two of my brother and sister, yeah. the yeah. cancer, yeah. for yes. this um, if this one applies to all cancer type or just a breast cancer? Very good question. You know, according to my hypothesis that the honey works on to two levels, or the mechanism of treating with the honey for, uh, depends on two levels. First, um, as you know, all of us, we have abnormal cells, growing daily basis. But because our immune system is very strong, therefore they get rid of the abnormal cells. For the cancer patient, the immune system starts to be weak and therefore, the cancer cells start to grow until they reach the cancer uh, as a disease. So my idea that if I return the immune system to be strong again, then the immune system is going to fight the abnormal cells like before. This is one mechanism. The second mechanism that in the, in the honey, there are substance, the antioxidant, and uh, as you know that the cancer cells, they just grow, 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 they don't die. But with the antioxidant or the flavonoids, the flavonoids, I think they are reprogrammed the cancer cells 
and after that return it to the normal cells, and then after that it can go for normal death like the apoptosis. So yes. So to answer uh, to your questions, that yes, uh, I use the honey for a different type of cancer patient, and it works. Yes. Yes. And did you look at the cellular response? To be honest, no. For one reason that you know this uh, this is my personal research. I'm I'm the one who funded, so I need a fund to be able to answer a lot of questions. And uh, before 2016, to be honest, I was thinking like a scientist, you know, to follow the research method. But in 2016, one of my best friends, she died because of the breast cancer. And then, you know, when she died, she passed away. So I said, okay, what is the benefit of my UK patent? At least, you know, it didn't save anyone's life. So therefore, I shift my thinking from the scientist to save people's <coughs> lives. Alhamdulillah, now a lot of patients, alhamdulillah, they're still alive. Even when they use the chemotherapy, the side effect of the chemotherapy, it reduced a lot. So how, how do you use the honey? I use the honey um, for my dosage. There are two, uh, one early morning between three to four o'clock, and the after uh, one. Just mind to reverse this uh, slide, please. Thank you. Because I, I missed it as well. Sorry. Ah, this is, okay. So this is one of the clinical case study. A woman, she diagnosed with the breast cancer. And according to her, that the size of the tumor is similar to the size of the mango seed. Uh, the oncologist um, advised her to take a chemotherapy, but she refused, and she used only the honey. And according to her, after eight weeks, the tumor shrink. And here, this is the two uh, his two reports, one early January 2018, and shows that she's a cancer patient in December 2018, unremarkable cells. The biopsy is the same area? From the same area. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, you said that you want to resource or fund. What did you, what's your idea about fund? Because a fund either the formal <laughs> resource or non-formal resource is it a charity? Is it? Do you have any idea about you, your requirement about fund or the requirement for the fund? I just need the money, you know, to to be able to to buy the honey, to be able to run the test. I mean, the blood test and X-ray, and to to pay, for example, for the participants, you know, to travel for their travel from their home to the center. So this is all what I requirement. And by the way, it's not expensive. It's very easy. To, uh, to do the clinical trial. Because what do I need? I need cancer patient, I need a honey, and x-ray and blood test, that's it. But you haven't got a control group. Uh, okay, very good. For the control group, um, to run the clinical trial, I'm, I'm planning to divide them to three groups. One, like control groups, they just follow the normal treatment. And the second one, normal treatment with the, with the honey, and then if, some of the patients, they are willing to use only honey there, and we'll compare between three of them. No, it's, it's even as a therapeutic uh, intervention yes. in reducing the tumor. Now you can induce cancer in an in, in animal model, and then you can d see the control compared to the thing. The same idea that you see you're planning to do it on uh, yes. the clinical level. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Someone has to be the devil, yeah? <laughs> but it is all in the scientific ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Tari Gidris. I'm working as um, um, I have um, um, what they call it a design company. Okay. I'm going to talk about the Sudan uh, recycling and. Um, I was a few days I came from Sudan and um, I see there are um, a lot of rubbish everywhere, especially in Khartoum. And um, now all people talking about healthy and, and how people to be healthy. And this is one of the 
important human being uh, uh, project actually. Everyone trying to be healthy as most as can as he can. So uh, recycling in Sudan is I can also say zero, but it's minus in minus. Uh, there is no any recycling company. They are just a few, but you cannot talk about them because they don't do any um, enough job of, of, uh, of recycling Sudan. A few years ago, I went to, uh, to Netherlands uh, for the same project and I was asking about recycling in, uh, in Netherlands and um, I went to the, the um, one, of, one of the company there asking about uh, recycling company in Netherlands. I found out only in, uh, in Rotterdam there are more than 400 companies working with recycling. And um, what I like to do now, I just like to have uh, support for all Sudanese in UK, in Europe, um, in Africa, in United States to support our country for the uh, to clean the country because I don't know who is was last a few months of a few years in Sudan but the the last government they done nothing about any any cleaning the country any development for the for the for the country so what I like to do um, I was starting now a few days ago to uh, to have more information how to how to uh, to clean the city very simple so the city is, is dirty there are a program here in UK they call it dirty house so they are dirty country by the way and dirty cities so I'm sorry to say that, but Khartoum today is one of the dirty cities. Very dirty. Wherever you go, you go they put the rubbish everywhere. They don't know how any education about how to use the, the, the bin for the, for the rubbish. And, uh, and they don't know anything about recycling, where to put the plastic, of the paper, of any, any kind of these things. So um, my uh, project is how can we help Sudanese to learn how to use the bin, how to use to, 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 to know about recycling. And even not the Sudanese inside Sudan, outside Sudan, but when we go the outside Sudan, I think one of the important things for everyone in his house, outside the house, especially outside the house, try to put bin of two bin outside your house. And we need, of course, many things like to have big cars for uh, to take the rubbish to the recycling companies. But this is cost a lot of money, of course. But uh, it not be like a minute of. It, it need times. So um, the thirty years, the last government, uh, Umar al Bashir and his. His group, they they just um, put Sudan in, in, in very deep, uh, uh, very deep problems, and we cannot get out, out of it if we are not together. So from here, I just like to tell all Sudanese and all people uh, as friend for Sudanese to support. Uh, support us and support each other to jump from this dirty city to be clean city and we like to change from the rubbish everywhere to put flowers everywhere and besides that we we need water everywhere because in, in Sudan now in Khartoum to find water is not easy even we have like three or four rivers in, in Khartoum you have the river Nile and you have the White Nile, I don't know. 
All is Nile and you walk in Khartoum, you cannot find water to clean yourself easy. So I was talking to uh, some company also, they, they have this pump for water to take the water from the ground. So we need water, water everywhere in Khartoum to clean the city. And we need uh, many stuff. I try to now to share with some friend what we need to clean the city. And uh, this is all Sudan actually, and not all Sudan, it's all Africa by the way. But Sudan, one of the, the important now country for us as Sudanese to clean it. And then maybe we can jump to other countries, uh, our neighbors of, of our uh, uh, other African country. Anyway, this is this is a project, and I'm not ready. Actually, I was late. I um, I was um, not well because I'm not well these days. I just uh, um, done my best to come here and to tell you about this. Thank you. So I ask you this question, but let me ask you again: Why people throw stuff on the street? Is it because there's no bin, to, or we are not having that culture of doing it? Or we just don't care which one of them. This is uh, important things uh, as all people talking here about education. If you don't educate yourself, you don't get right education. You don't know what is kind of bin it is, and uh, you don't know how to put bin outside your house. It's not important to put inside your house because I I believe every Sudanese house is very clean, but just go free three or four steps from your home of three meters is disgusting mm. and it is about they are they are very bad example because if someone put the rubbish outside the people continue to put the rubbish the same way so the bad example that make us uh, of the sudanese keep doing the same mistakes okay. yeah to, to add to that i think people are socialized into a way of thinking because as you said if everybody else is doing it why, why am I going to be any different? Um, I actually noticed a pile of rubbish outside the mosque um, for Salat al Juma when we went there. So I waited until the, the khutbah had ended and I spoke to the Imam. I said, Look, there's, there's a pile of rubbish outside the mosque. And his answer was, Sudan Kida. <laughs> Kida means uh, this is how we are. Yeah, yeah we like that. Kida means how we are. Uh, this is the way we are. I lived, I lived in Nigeria. Uh, for three years uh, in the late 80s and they had a similar problem in Lagos uh, and the, the government rolled out a program to keep Lagos clean I'll share that with you afterwards um, and what it was they took a day up it was Friday Friday morning and Saturday morning where there was no traffic there was no work for three hours between 9 and 12 you were responsible for cleaning your own street they'll come and give you the tools and everything and even including like surgical masks so you don't breathe in the uh, chemicals or whatever it is that so they, they they made that a community activity it it, it worked uh, the problem is they, they didn't sustain it and then the government changed you know the, the normal thing um, recycling in Sudan I don't know I mean I see some street young kids going around with these the bags yeah. I don't know I don't know what they're doing with this they sell yeah, yeah, it's, but it's, that's not recycling and uh, mm. you said it's the uh, you made reference to the cities but even outside of the cities you find plastic bags just on the trees as well and it just it seems to be everywhere uh, and something needs to be done because it's actually destroying the environment people are trying to do things uh, from what I saw I just I was there recently uh, and they're burning the rubbish but that that was another problem in itself in terms of what's what's happening with the, with the toxicity. So. I don't know if there's still a campaign to keep cartoon clean. I don't. They're still good. Whatever happened to them? I don't know. Are, are you part of that group or? No, but it's, uh, it's the work is zero. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm telling you, I just came like four days from yeah. Sudan. It's, it is the work is zero. It is no organization, no society, no government. No one work, no one care. Mm -hmm. And we was last to, to start doing something. And I, I, I also telling people, if we are here in UK, for example, everyone 
just pay 100 pound a year. Sudanese in, in UK, Sudanese in Europe, 100 uh, euro a year. And in USA, 100 dollars a year. Saudi Arabia and Middle East, just like 100 dirham of 100 real a year. Sudan is inside Sudan, 100 pound a year. It's a lot of money. A lot of money, we can change all the city. Not only Khartoum, we can change the whole city, like Madani, like Port Sudan, like Urbayid, like Fashir, Niala, whatever cities they are in Sudan. <coughs> Um, thank you. I, uh, we, uh, this need uh, an external fund. I think the core of the problem is um, responsibility and system. So the, the local government, they have a skeleton of uh, staff that should do this job. They have even some private companies who's dedicated to do this job. They don't, but they don't do it. Whether they have a shortage, whether they don't care, that is the question. Um, I know the, the, the youth in, in Sudan in many areas, they do their best. And I, I've witnessed with my eyes um, during the time of the rainy season where all the roads are kind of just messy and everything. The, the, these these young youngsters, they do uh, a lot of um, good job. They kind of try to pave the road. They can try to, you know, do their whatever they can. Um, so there is a very um, important um, community participation in these problems. But yet, um, yes, the problem is big because you need funding. You cannot compare Sudan with UK. Um, and I think we need to go back and um, see what is the root of the problem. Is it because of the local council? Is it because of the uh, local people? Is it, uh, it has to be something shared responsibility and there should be some sort of disciplinary actions for, for these areas because some areas are not like what you described um it is different not not all uh, i haven't been there for maybe six months or so but um um i think uh the problem need to be kind of just discussed locally and um it should be possible to to achieve it but um one like since you touched the environment i would like to add one important point um the, the whole envi the environment as a whole, like I mean, inside the city and outside, and um, we're, we're having a, a problem with uh, desertification and drought, you know, like the, the era of the 80s and 90s. And uh, the, the major contributor to this is um, cutting the trees. And um, I, I have produced a, a short video, I don't know, I didn't put my name on it like about six uh, months ago, of a um, uh, people who are merchant on the um, charcoal industry who goes to uh, and film that unfortunately and is in the Facebook if you if you if you type in Arabic you know Faham Mustalih you will see how those people are brutal on the trees with the electric saws they come to an area which is like a big forest they turn it into uh, like I mean just uh, an, 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 an empty uh, area why? Because they get this money and there is no kind of censorship, there is no kind of accountability of what they're doing and they're not aware even or they don't care about the consequences on this, on the changing of the environment and the drought and all this type of uh, problems that will follow. Thank you very much for touching the environment. I think it is an important topic. Okay. Uh, I'm just wise of the time because we've got very limited time. Can I introduce Bani and then maybe we can have the last few minutes if you want to talk. But uh, there is one thing about, uh, well, I think as Mani said, it's a very well, like, great thing you're doing. Thank it, you. Well, like. Thanks. Uh, uh, I have said this many times and I would like to say it again on record. I don't think the, the problem of cleaning, our culture in cleaning, has nothing to do with what happened in the last 30 years. In Arabic, we had nothing to do with Kazan. Why? Because when we were in the university, 
medical, not medical, sorry, all university students, we were not very good in cleaning our own rooms. You remember in the university campus? It's, I, can't, I don't want to try to remember <laughs> or to remind myself how was the toilets and the bathroom we used at the university campus. We are not educated at all to use this stuff. That's the core of the problem. We are not. We don't care. You remember in the room, you share the room with someone, you know, Saud, they throw it in the room in front of you. It was the most disgusting scene you will ever see. You're sharing a room with someone, either up or down, and he will just spit on there. I mean, this is, has been very common. The, our ba so I think we need education. And, and this is what brings us back to what we said in 1999 when we started this organization. We said there will be no sustainable development in the whole world without education. And our model, which was published with the MIT colleague, uh, Josephine, we had education in the, in the middle of everything. Because if you don't teach them, if people are not, if you don't, no, no matter how much you spend money on any other thing, people will still throw, the, throw the, the plastic bag on the street. And then you have to cover the consequence. What's happening here is education. Professor Bani, I would like to introduce you. <coughs> if you also highlight, because he has just met a few days ago the American ambassador to Sudan. Yes. Who, the, uh, and I think you might be, if there's no confidentiality in what mm. you have done, tell us what did you learn from there. Okay, Professor. Uh, thank you. I just arrived from Heathrow Airport for two hours from a flight from Washington, D.C. on my way to Saudi Arabia. I have two hats. I am currently an adjunct professor at Emory University School of Public Health, Global Health. And at the same time, a professor of community medicine in Umargora University in Saudi Arabia. I'm just leaving uh, this uh, this evening. Uh, I would like to talk uh, about uh, my two initiatives, and then uh, brief you about uh, <coughs> uh, first. Uh, the first initiative is about cyber mentoring, in which. Uh, Diaspora Sudanese help the uh, Sudan young scientists and students in health sciences <coughs> research. And in this uh, initiative, uh, which will be through the diaspora in the US and UK, uh, including the Sudanese association professors in the, in the US, uh, medics, and also uh, Yukana. Khartoum University graduates <coughs> in the U.S. also. So they are supporting uh, this initiative in which we are going to uh, recruit mentors and mentees. Uh, the mentors are scientists uh, in the U.K. or U.S. And the mentees are young scientists uh, who yes, or young professionals who would like to publish and also uh, students in the health sciences uh, professional program, whether medical student or dental or pharmacy. And I am going to start a pilot project with the Sudan uh, Association of Professors uh, and to also select one of the high education institutes in Sudan as a pilot and then we go uh, through uh, to uh, implement uh, all over and see how things go. So this is just, and the scope is that it will be about a two-year program in which the mentee and mentees which w who will be matched together to work starting from the ideas, the proposal, and then implementing the project, <coughs> analyzing, writing a report, and publishing. So we hope within two years, and this can be a medical student or a graduate student or a young faculty member who didn't publish. And the uh, deliverable will be uh, publications and uh, high quality research. So we hope we got the support of the Minister of Higher Education in this uh, initiative. Uh, the other initiative is a, a partnership between uh, U.S. University and uh, Sudan universities. I already started this initiative two weeks ago. I was in Khartoum, and I met the Undersecretary of Higher Education, 
uh, in which he asked me to uh, work with the Faculty of Medicine Khartoum University for uh, coordinating this initiative. Uh, the initiative is with Yale School of Public Health, uh, in which it will partner with the four institutions in Sudan, Khartoum University, Nilen University, Ahfad University, and Jazeera University, and the Minister of Health uh, through the uh, Public Health Institute. And the main objective is to strengthen the graduate education in, uh, in public health. And, and the program, it will be a two to three years program in which uh, faculty from Sudan will go to the U.S. for three to four months in which they review the curriculum and update the curriculum. And at the same time, faculty from Yale come to Sudan to teach uh, advanced courses in epidemiology or biostatistics or uh, implementation science. And the uh, visit from, te uh, from Yale uh, faculty will be to Sudan in March, early March. Uh, the visit will be for five days and meeting with the partner institute uh, to uh, at least to initiate the project and at the same time we are seeking funding for this project which will take about two to three years at least and after these four institutions then we uh, plan to expand to other institutions because there are about 10 to 12 uh, graduate public health uh, programs uh, including community medicine master in Khartoum Medical School, and there is a board of community medicine, and there is MPH programs in Ahfad and Nilen, and also the Public Health Institute has uh, programs. So these are the two initiatives, and I'm also I have a third initiative uh, in which there will be a summer training for medical students in the U.S. Uh, for uh, clinical scholarship, and I'm now discussing with the Sudan Association of uh, Professors in uh, in the U.S. Uh, concerning my meet, uh, the meeting I attended the briefing last week with uh, His Excellency the Ambassador Booth, the special envoy to Sudan. Uh, the main objective was to talk. Uh, to the Sudanese diaspora also about what's their role in helping Sudan and he also briefed about the current status of Sudan-U.S. Uh, relationship and also there is progress and they are very happy of what's going on in the uh, Sudan uh, government and the progress in the peace and we're looking forward that there should be a great support from the diaspora in building the economy and especially uh, providing uh, technical assistance uh, at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Bani. This is a very uh, this is a great for both the first one. My uh, questions regarding the first. so how do men What's the plan for the for the period you select them, and uh, do you provide them with specific training to supervise the mentees in Sudan? And to what extent are they going to be involved in the research? And what would be the motive for the mentors to join and to continue um, mentoring the mentees uh, on the long run? Thank you. Fair uh, is the. We are going to recruit them, it will be on voluntary basis. Uh, the mentors will start by voluntary basis. And we plan for an induction uh, workshop, if possible in Khartoum, <coughs> for the mentors uh, so that to uh, work on the process of mentoring. And at the same time, uh, I think if there is any ideas about research, <laughs> the motive may be to be as uh, part of the research team, uh, helping in public, especially in publication. This will be one of the motivation. This as a starting. 
But in the future, we may look for funding if there is funding because some mentors they may ask for uh, uh, some sort of uh, incentive. <coughs> but at the beginning, we will start by uh, voluntary from the Sudanese diaspora, and I found some of them are really keen to help. Any other question? your initiatives uh, just to add up about the diaspora I think at the diaspora we need to be in one body because now we have so many bodies around all the world working in different areas and that's I think bombard the government with all ideas by the end of the day they will get nothing the government and the diaspora I think I talked to Salam before and to you as well if we can form one umbrella for all these diaspora in America and Saudi Arabia to be in one speaking one 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 voice, one word, it will be better for the government and for Sudanese people back. And like today, uh, Alam invited us, the ministries ask us what they need. Because nowadays everybody is advisor to the Sudanese government. They can't work like that. They need to go to all professionals they can work. They can wait for them to ask us what we need from us, not offering the advice. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I think that it is the receiving end. The Sudanese government should have a body yes. that co coordinate all this. Yes. You cannot uh, you unify all this because you have different bodies and different specialties and different. Mm. But if there is a knowledge transfer, as Prof. Alam mm. has suggested before, to have even a body or a ministry or a very effective, this will have an impact because all the initiative will go to one body receiving end. Instead of now some people talking to different bodies in Sudan and you have a lot of initiative going on. So we hope that we have one body in Sudan at the receiving end. And also one on within the diaspora as well, so there'll be like a single point of contact. Yeah. Also. Yes. So we hope like the US group and the UK group have <laughs> one group. Hopefully, yes. I think we need to conclude. I, know, I think at time, we only got three, uh, seven minutes, I think. I think we thank you all for taking the time because I think it's very difficult. And I would like to say a few things about Farida. Farida, thank you so much for making this room available. <coughs> I mean, I know it for myself because I failed to get a room in East London University. All the rooms they are taken by the church for Sunday. It's very difficult to have a room in a university now. It's very costly. It's very expensive. Uh, the one we used to, uh, to, to use it for weekends, it costs 1,000 pounds. And it, because it's very difficult, you have to get security. You have to get IT people and so on. But Frida, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate that. And I really... Uh, we are we are privileged to have people like you to be involved in our, if you like, national uh, issues. And I always say this when I go to Sudan. I say to them, when someone, we say to you, this person is this and this, or this one is from Yale, like Professor Bani mentioned, please listen to that word carefully. When we say Queen Mary Medical School, we're talking about top medical school. When I say this is from Cambridge, I keep telling people in Sudan, please listen to that word carefully. When I said to you, we have a people from Cambridge doing training in Khartoum. This is one of the best medical school. May I talked about May? I said she got three master degree. Maybe you got four. I hope you got more. UCL is a, one of the best urban planning blah 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 institute. So I really hope the message you really get across. We want to tell them, and this is what I hope in this dinner with the with the prime with the minister, and I hope you all do that. Don't be humble. One of our problems is the humbleness of Sudanese. They are so humble. Uh, Saif, who left here, he got his master from LSE. Yeah, LSE in economic in our d area is one of the best schools worldwide. And I remember a professor from Maryland said to me, Alam, if someone from LSE comes to us in Maryland and he talk rubbish, we still clap for him. So you can see the amount. So we need the messages, the quality and the, quant the, the quantity and also the quality of those who are diaspora is the best you can actually ask for. I don't think you will get more better. Muhammad Wakenford, which is one of our leading companies here.
quality control and so on. So I think we will finish here and 